All right. Oh, Pocky. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I heard raccoon screeches. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. I'm glad you could make it. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a different stream for me. I have been working on, well, I do a lot of ceramics just as a side hobby. And it was Josuiji Shinri's birthday a few days ago. He's from Hollow Stars EN. He's one of my favorite VTubers. And he has a lot of koi themed uh, elements in his streams and in his lore and backstory. So I made, I'm holding a koi mug that I made. I made a bunch of them because it was a lot of different things that I was trying for the first time, a lot of different techniques. I'm still a total amateur at ceramics, but um, yeah, I wanted to make a mug because Shinri's always got, you know, a mug of coffee or some other beverage going on. And uh, I wanted to have something I could just like sip on when I'm watching his streams or zatsus or whatever. And... <laughs> Uh, it turns out that for his official birthday merch, he actually released a completely different mug with a completely different design, but a similar glazing technique on the outside, which was really cool. So I'll have that to drink out of as well when I'm not using this. Um, but yeah, since I... It was like a big process. Oh, thanks, Joe. Good to see you. <laughs> um, let me move over to the video screen because... Uh, God, what was I going to say? Um... These took a long time, and they're not perfect. There's a lot of things I want to improve on. I want to do a second round, but um, it was a really fun experience, and I recorded all of it with a borrowed GoPro. Hi, Nitrous. <laughs> I'm glad you could make it. Yeah. Um, I borrowed actually two GoPros. To, thank you to um, film, you know, just how everything was made from start to finish and so we're gonna sit back i'm like wheeling out the tv like a substitute teacher and i am going to sit here and show you how these mugs were made so let me move on into oh yeah and you can see on the inside um it's like this melted glaze technique that it was supposed to look like fish scales i wanted it to look like koi scales it wasn't perfect. I think there are definitely things I could do next time to make it better. But yeah, I mean, you'll see. You'll kind of see. You'll kind of see how it goes because um, my video got corrupted at the very end and the angles were weird. Like I had the, the GoPro tilted too far down on my forehead. It was funky. But anyway, I'll, I'll just jump in. Uh, let's see here. Okay, good old VLC. Yeah. <laughs> Orange and grapefruit rinds. Yes. I love citrus teas. You know, I love citrus teas. So yeah, that's probably what I'm going to be drinking out of. It'll be a nice theme. But here um, I'm just in the studio. I'm starting off with my clay. I pulled it straight out of the bag. It's nice and fresh. It's, uh, you know, it comes to you from the manufacturer in these like 25 pound bags. And I'm just slicing them up with this little wire tool. It's got these ergonomic handles on it. It's very nice. Uh, you... I mean, in general, it's nice to start with fresh clay because it's all extruded from like one big thing of slurry and it won't have any air pockets in it. But air pockets down the line can cause a lot of issues in firing. But, um, you know, we're starting fresh. You don't have to worry as much. You still want to knead it, though, and make it malleable. And what I'm doing here is I cut it into cubes, and I'm trying to make sure all the cubes are kind of a uniform shape and size. I'm weighing them. This isn't a very good scale. <laughs> you want it to be mozzarella? I wish I could get 25 pounds of mozzarella. God, in a big tube. Just suck it out like a gogurt. But, yeah, like, making for sure they're kind of uniform, because I know that I need about two pounds of clay to create a nice big mug. And... It may seem like overkill. The two pounds includes the water weight and everything uh, that's with the clay. When it gets dried out, it loses weight. And then um, when it's baked, it shrinks down and compresses even more. So the finished mugs are like less than a pound each. But uh, here I'm kneading it. I'm just making sure that the clay is malleable. It's not too much of a concern when you're getting it fresh from the bag, but I still like to do it. And you can, you know, form it into more of a ball shape versus the cube. The ball is a lot easier to make things out of when you're throwing them on the wheel because it's round. And, yeah. Kneading them like this so that <laughs> I'm going turbo mode. I'm going super speed. Uh, 
just making sure there's no little bits of schmutz in there, no bubbles, um, you know, this method of kneading help. And like, especially this kind of percussive smacking around of the clay, like throwing it onto the table really helps make sure there's no air bubbles in there because, um, again, going into turbo mode, uh, the thing that happens when a piece of clay has air bubbles in it is that those trapped bubbles of air once the clay enters the kiln will expand and so like best case scenario your piece cracks which is still not a good outcome but worst case scenario it explodes and it takes out the other pieces of clay around it and everybody's mad at you so uh we're just ensuring none of that happens now i'm forming it into a nice round ball it feels like being a baker you're like kneading and forming i was on a bread kick as i'm sure everybody else was like you know, a couple years ago, and just, I, I think the experience of forming nice uniform rounds of dough really helped. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, this is one of the parts that honestly takes the longest in ceramics, is just making sure the clay's ready. I'm using a type of clay called B-Mix, which fires to a really nice uniform pale color. I wanted it because I wanted to have vibrant colors on the end piece, and um, it's also just a super easy clay to work with. It's really soft, um, but it's also kind of elastic. It holds tension really well. And I like how it is to just work with it when it's on the wheel. It's very, very forgiving. It's very, very friendly to do. Mm -hmm. And I form out these little clay balls all in a row. I started out with four here. Um, <laughs> I ended up going back and making a lot more mugs later um, just to make sure I had enough to experiment with. But yeah, like, you know, you're doing all this prep, all these things to ensure that the mug will be nice or that whatever vessel you're making will be nice and uniform towards the end, especially when you're trying to make stuff that's kind of, not identical. I'm not at the point where I can make anything that's identical, but you know. I'll have things that are somewhat uniform. So I'm down at the wheel now. I've got my towel. I use the towel over my leg just because my apron's not that big. So it's just there to keep my pants from getting dirty. <laughs> I've got my work pants and my work boots on. And because like sometimes it, you know, uh, the wheel is like controlled by a foot pedal so right now I'm putting pressure on the foot pedal to get it to spin but it you know if you sneeze or you get surprised or something I'm cleaning up the wheel right now um like there is a tendency for wet clay to like splatter everywhere or fly off or just get lodged someplace it shouldn't be so you know it's even though I'm not wearing clothes I'm super attached to I still I don't like getting all dirty I don't want to have to shower. I don't want to have to walk home with clay all over me. So still forming this. There's a little dimple there. So I started smacking it out. You spank the clay a lot and throw it down into the center. That was a nice throw. I usually don't do that, but just patting it down, throwing it into the center creates suction. So it won't lift up or, you know, kind of scoot around when you're applying pressure to it on the clay wheel and then I kind of push down the edges as well now I use water on my hands uh, this helps your hands glide over the clay it helps saturate the clay with more water so that it's easier to form and I'm coning it right now I'm making it more vertical and skinny and this upwards central pressure helps keep the clay centered and while making it more malleable so um, this process you do it a couple of times I do it a lot more than some people because I'm just still new to this and not great at it but um, I like to make it long and tall and skinny like that and then <laughs> she going on my clay till I mug <laughs> highly do <laughs> yeah I'm just making sure it's nice and centered and that it'll respond well to me trying to manipulate it later. <laughs> uh, it takes a little while. But yeah, you can tell now it's easier to form. It's getting a little wiggly, but as long as you're like keeping it centralized, it's nice. <laughs> Don't be sorry. That's the kind of joke I would make if I wasn't just blabbering right now. 
Yeah. So you make the cone, you make it super tall, and then you push it back down and make it kind of round like a little friend. And this is where I'm trying to like also, you can see it actually got a little bit off center. So what I'm doing with my hands doing that V shape is getting it back in center. You use your elbows close to your sides as leverage. You keep your body centered and you just use your body weight to kind of push the clay around. And so, you know, you can tell when it dances a little bit, it starts to get a little wobble in it. That's when you have to course correct a little bit, but uh, doing the cone helps. And <laughs> it, it, I, I don't have anything non-sussy to say about what, what it does when it's coding. But um, one thing <laughs> that I'm doing here uh, is you can kind of push in at the base as well. Sometimes, at least for me, like the wobble is coming from the very base of it because of the way I've pushed it down to start. So, um, you know, you can use your hands or even scrape away a little bit of it to, there we go. That looks a little better. That looks centered. I'm like, I already forget what I was having an issue with here. Uh, I think I filmed this over a month ago, so it's out of my mind. Wow, it's it's strong. The wobbles are so strong, they're shaking my GoPro. <laughs> We're throwing more water on, just keeping the surface nice and slick. And yeah, that looks centered. That looks non-wobbly. That looks fine. I'm pushing down on it with the palm of my hand. And I'm feeling out like sometimes the top is a little wobbly too. You just want it to be uniform. And now I can push in and start forming the little cup. And I'm spreading it open with both my thumbs. This is this is fine. This is this this is within the TOS. This is fine. I'm just slowly gaping this clay. <laughs> you got to keep it nice and wet. Use your longest fingers. But um, I'm applying pressure to the bottom of it because you want to compress the clay down. Uh, you want to make sure that is a nice solid base so that. Um, it doesn't form cracks in it later because the base is going to be the most saturated with water the way this process goes. You want lots of water on the inside so that your fingers never stick to the inside, especially look how much clay I'm catching. Like you just end up with a ton of clay on your hands. And if you don't keep it wet, then your fingers can catch on it and like disrupt the flow, disrupt the shape. It'll get all wobbly. It's not fun. But um, yeah, I'm pushing down on the inside so that um, that excess water won't be trapped in there, if that makes sense. Because you want to control the rate at the gaping in my video gamer. <laughs> but yeah, you want to control the rate at which um, the clay dries after you're done throwing it. And if one part is drier than another, the part that's not as dry will be prone to cracking because it's meeting resistance against the drier clay. And the base is the, usually the part that dries out the slowest. So you want the least water there at the end of when you're throwing. So now it's in kind of a bowl shape and uh, there are different ways to apply pressure here. I'm using the flat of my outside finger. Um, it's kind of like the part where your knuckle makes that point. Uh, I take a couple of different tries. Some people can pull it up really smoothly. I am like super cautious, especially I think because I was being filmed. Um, I, you know, push in with the bottom finger and then the finger that's inside the cup is slightly above it and helps steady it upward. So you're drawing your finger upward. It, you can see a sort of spiral forming and the spiral ideally is pretty uniform and pretty small so that um, everything, you know, is the same thickness and goes up to the same height. Um, what was I going to say? Like, there's still a little bit of a wobble and you can see the way I pull, it also creates kind of an outward, like, flute at the top. This is just me. Um, so I use my hands a lot between poles 
to just smooth it out and make sure it's a cylinder, make sure it's uniform. I'm always trying to feel it to make sure that, you know, there's no parts where the clay is significantly thicker than one piece. It can still be corrected. And that fluting part on the outside, you know, you don't want that. I'm still working on practicing to get rid of that. But, you know, it can all be corrected if you're careful. I'm also measuring it just next to my hands because I have a general idea of how big I want the cup to be, but like, I, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not so precise that I'm gonna bring in a ruler or anything. But yeah, we've got our cylinder going, drawing it up one more time. The walls are getting pretty thin because of how much I've been pulling it up. And it feels okay. I wonder what I was thinking at this point. I think I wanted to go higher. Can we get much higher? So high. Oh, 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 oh. But yeah. And it doesn't have to stay this shape either. So here, I think what I'm doing is pu pushing it out rather than up. It's getting thinner, but I'm starting to form that kind of tapered bottom mug shape where I like having a little bit of roundness. I like having a little bit of a curve to it. And it wants to be really, you know, really slick because this is when the walls are the thinnest. But yeah, I'm just trying to create a smooth kind of tapered curve up the walls and make sure that it's all uniform. Now, it looks like I'm getting done. Um, the sponge is helpful. It just draws out all that excess moisture. You can see a little bit, I'm like nitpicking my own work. I can see a little bit of a wobble in there. It's like, I can see it next to me on my desk, but I'm all like, yeah. You gotta, you gotta work on that. But yeah, just um, finalizing, fine tuning. And some people who are much more skilled than me will like basically smooth out and surface the entire thing while it's still on the wheel and make it super uniform and perfect. I have a lot of different tricks to fix things, fix imperfections after the fact. So it's not that bad. Um, I find that the more I mess with something, like <laughs> I can see, I can see little ridges forming. I can see little wobbles happening on the rim. But uh, the more I try to mess with something when it's in progress on the wheel, the more likely it is that I'm just gonna like crush it or like flop it over or something, and it's just gonna be terrible. So gently, 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 you know, going over it with the sponge, but not overworking it. Hopefully. This one survived, so <laughs> I think it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I should start making teapots next. But... Oh, and I've got this little handy wood tool. So this helps me trim the base of it. Um, you don't want a ton of clay at the base because again, it's retaining a lot of water. So I'm just taking this tool and carving this edge taking off chunks of clay. I can save those for later and use them for other purposes. They aren't going to be great for throwing unless I process them, but I can still like use them for decoration or I can use them uh, as what? I'm blanking. I can like, yeah, process them, put them in some water, like kind of reform the clay and then rework it, do the same kneading process that I was going over earlier to make clay that I can throw again. Or um, the studio I belong to has a big reclaim bucket where if you're a member, you get 10 pounds worth of the reclaim for like a dollar or something ridiculous. So, you know, if you donate scraps of clay to that, you can have practice clay later for a really good price. So clay doesn't go to waste unless you're being really intentional, <laughs> intentional about wasting it. Yeah, just evening out the bottom, trimming, trimming, trimming. I'm making a little gap right underneath the edge because uh, earlier when I smacked the clay down on the center of the wheel, it created that suction and I'm going to have to remove the clay. You know, the I'm going to have to pull that wire tool through and negate that suction. I'm going to have to like slice it off of the wheel. And so I'm loading it up with water which is a cool technique that uh, the owner of the studio taught me because, um, and I'm washing my hands because I, I just don't like having dirty hands. Uh, the clay is saturated, the wheel is full of water. 
I've got a wooden bat here. It's just a plank. It's probably some scrap wood from Home Depot. I'm taking the wire and I'm pulling it against the bottom through and keeping it on the wheel. But the water helps it glide off of that little part. You can see where it was connected to the wheel, where it was stuck to the wheel, and the water helps glide your little pot or cup or whatever you've made off of it. This is the stupidest way to remove something. This is, I'm, I'm doing this, this, this is going to leave so many fingerprints and smudges and potential gaps and divots on your like piece, but it, I trim them afterward. So it doesn't really matter that much to me. There's ways you can do it like without making any hand contact at all, but yeah, I'm, I'm just being lazy. Um, I trimmed that excess clay off of the wheel. I'm cleaning it up again so I can start a new piece nice and clean. Yeah, the wheel gets this like machine oil on it. That's that dark stuff you see when the towel makes contact with it. I don't know what that is. I don't know why it happens. It's like so much dark, greasy stuff and it's never present when I'm actually putting clay on there, but it's fine. Yeah, so now the clay, I, I sponged it off with the wet and now I dried it off with the towel so it's nice and dry. You need a dry surface to get that suction um, when you're throwing the next lump of clay on there. But yeah, just being, I'm so picky. I, I don't like having my hands dirty. I don't like getting my clothes dirty, even though they're my chore clothes. It's like, that was a good one too. Uh, I don't know why I chose this hobby, but I like it a lot. <laughs> it's totally worth having to deal with like dirtiness. I just wear, I like wearing the gloves because I don't like shit getting under my fingernails. I really hate that feeling, but you can't really have long fingernails anyway to do clay. Otherwise you just make gouges as I've learned too many times. But yeah, starting a new one, coning up, having a good time, dumping on lots of water. That's why I like using this type of clay too. Some clays if you put too much water on them, they get really finicky or they get too soft. This one, it takes whatever you throw at it. That little knob dancing around. <laughs> this is a funky shaped cone, but just pushing it down so I can pull it back up. It looks like, it looks like a bow bun. It's the exact same size and shape and color. I should have gotten Chinese for dinner. <laughs> yeah, you can just hypnotize yourself too. the swirl. Oh, God, what was that? Ugh. I, I do mop the floors after I make sure I mop the floors after I do this stuff. I promise I clean up after myself. You're supposed to. You. <laughs> You don't want the reputation as the person who just flings clay everywhere and then leaves it. But yeah, I it's it's really funky looking when that little bit of wet clay bulges out of the top. I'm not going to comment on it any further, but yeah, making a nice cone, sitting up straight. It feels centered. It's almost something where I like, I'm at the point where looking at it, you can see how uneven it looks, but you kind of have to go by feel, just so your eyes don't deceive you. I wonder if I'm going to get motion sick from staring at it too long. I don't know. <laughs> Making another cone. And yeah, there are techniques and tools you can use to make sure that you're, you know, if you want to throw a series of different forms of different items, but keep them uniform, you can like get different gauges and measuring sticks that will help you know what height and width to we reach. But at the same time, I just wanted something that would fit in my hand. I have big old yaoi hands and like, I figure, you know, that's a good size for a coffee mug. So yeah, like I'm, I'm just winging it. They turn out somewhat consistent, but some are definitely taller than others, like slightly different taper width, slightly different curves. It's chill. They're handmade. Yeah. 
always scraping. So really, really wet clay, like when it's in a liquid state, is called slip. And if too much of it builds up on my hands just from the constant like exchange of water and, you know, working on it. Oh, thank you, Pockies. <laughs> I want to visit you and maybe we can find a pottery studio and we can do pottery together. That would be fun. I really enjoy it. Like I took a ceramics class in high school where we only had like one wheel. It was mostly working with clay, um, you know, by hand which was really fun, but like, I didn't get a chance to really try the wheel stuff while I was there. And, you know, if you did, it was like, you know, a 45 minute class period. So you get like three minutes to do one try and then the next kid gets to, it's, it's tough. So I took a class like a year ago, a little over a year ago. And the instructor was so great. I totally loved it. I was like, I'm just going to do this now. And so I made a lot of embarrassing stuff. <laughs> I've come a long way, I feel like, and there's still a long ways to go, but it's something that's really just about focusing and, you know, it's nice to work with your hands. It's nice to feel like you're doing something that, you know, it's, it's nice to have something tangible, I think. It's nice to have something that, like eventually becomes something useful and it honestly doesn't take that long like I, f I personally feel like this video is kind of dragging on but when you're in the zone it's like oh you know oh I just it's been 30 seconds and I suddenly have a little flower pot or a vase or a bowl or whatever you want I've got some stuff coming out of the kiln soon that I'm really excited for I've been like, partly because of this project, I bought a ton of new glazes, and I'm really excited to use them all. It's dangerous, though. This is the type of hobby where you just, you know, you can make it as frugal or as expensive as you want. <laughs> like, I'm not at the point where I had a boss who had, like, you know, did the same thing as me, took, like, a big total beginner class and loved it, and then, you know, within a couple months, she bought her own kiln, she bought her own wheel for her backyard, like, she went all in. I'm not at that point yet. I'm, you know, just buying fun little tools. You can you can get all sorts of weird little doohickeys for, like, two, or two to three bucks, you know, little wooden tools that you can use to make impressions or shape the thing the way you want, but... Yeah, like, you can also go fancy gold leaf route and <laughs> do all sorts of insane firing techniques. Oh, it's getting really shuddery there because of how I pushed on it. So I'm just pushing my hands against the base. Like I said earlier, the base can wobble and that can throw you off even if the rest of the clay is centered. So I'm trying to do that. And when the base is wobbly like that, it's still... Cr it makes the top of it a little wobbly, but it's correctable. It's something you can deal with pretty easily. Like that looks a lot better. But yeah, no. I mean, I really enjoy going to the studio because there's so many other people who do a lot of experimental stuff there and you get to like learn from what they're doing. You get to see all the different glaze combos they use or like the different ways they decorate their pots. Oh, that's a nice pull. Hell yeah. That's smooth. We'll like trade tips and tricks. Oh, and it's dog friendly, so I get dog time. I get to meet little dogs. There's there's a nice poodle who comes. She's so cute. But also like tangent but dogs really like the taste of clay I don't think it's good for them I always make sure that my hands aren't dirty when I'm petting the studio dogs but they really 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 want to lick clay off your fingers they really want to go stick their little snouts into whatever you're doing on the wheel it's really adorable but it's also like I don't know <laughs> I don't want you to eat what's essentially like sand <laughs> wet sand dog cafe yes it's like there's even like little handmade dog dishes for water and treats and stuff elsewhere in the studio. Oh, it's wobbly. Why is it wobbly? Oh god. But yeah, dogs are dogs are good to have around as long as they're like chill and not upset that they have to sit in a slightly noisy place. Why is it wobbling? 
what the why did I why did I film this? <laughs> no. It's wobbling. Uh what am I gonna do? Am I gonna trim it? I'm like desperate to trim it. Mm, what am I gonna do? Sometimes uh if it's like a vertical wobble I don't know, it seems like a horizontal wobble. I don't even I don't even know if those are the terms, but if it's a vertical wobble, I'll like take the wire tool and like slice the top off so that I can just make sure it's all an even height. Doing this with the sponge can help as well. Maybe I just lived with it. Maybe I was just like, you know what? I've got a lot of clay to get through. I'm just going to deal with it. Because, yeah, there's there's more processing you can go through. Like, luxuriously soaking my hands off. What am I doing? Yeah, I guess I decided to just roll with it. It's getting trimmed. Ugh, that's so irritating. <laughs> it's more apparent to me visually, I think. Maybe it's the fisheye lens on the GoPro making it more... I don't know. <laughs> More apparent, but yeah. Also, each of these is like the size of a small flower pot. Like, well, not not that small of a flower pot. I would say, like measuring my hands, like a four to five inch flower pot size because the clay shrinks so much when it gets baked. It goes through the kiln once um, for the bisque firing, which is just a dry firing. It doesn't have it usually doesn't have any decorations on it it'll be when after the clay is fully formed and dried out and then after that you decorate it with glazes and things like that and you can put it through the final firing and that's when it becomes completely waterproof all the water and moisture gets out of the clay so that um it can retain water and retain moist things without absorbing them okay it's less wobbly now okay I guess I did okay. <laughs> Being super fucking critical. Okay, yeah, and I'm smoothing out the edge. Uh, uh. Why? Okay. Yeah. I'm like, it's done as it's gonna be. Uh, just screwing with the wire. It's all caught. Sometimes, like... <laughs> sometimes... I'll mess up and the wire will get caught like on the wheel and just turn into this death trap machine. It'll just start flailing everywhere and clay gets everywhere and it's terrifying but it's fun because it breaks up a little bit of the monotony. Uh. Okay. Yeah. This is why you don't pick up your stuff directly from the wheel because like you just saw it pinch in a little bit. You can reform it with your hands. It'll usually snap back to its original shape um, because of the elasticity of the clay. But, you know, it's it's not optimal. There are some cool wheels that have little... It's almost like a slot in the center, so you can put in a smaller piece of, like, medium fiberboard or something. Yeah, it's a fun death trap machine. <laughs> it's terrifying. The most terrifying thing is when you have something on there and like it gets it gets loose oh i'm making a hypnosis circle i'm going to hypnotize you chat but if you're getting watching this you're getting very relaxed you're going to put the 16 digits of your credit card in the chat you're going to put in the secret code on the back as well <laughs> but yeah no it's like things can get flung around very quickly things can get Things can get weird and scary really quickly. Oh, I'm speeding up again. I'm like, there's no time. I gotta get this done. It's gotta go as fast as possible. Let me scoot through this a little bit, because I think you get the gist by now. Doing one more. Oh, she's shuddery. She's shaking. It's not too bad. It's not as wobbly as the last one. That little flute at the top happens because I kind of like take my fingers off of it too soon, but the edge, the rim of a pottery cup or pot or whatever you're making 
it's super easy to kind of like compress that in with your hands or flute it out with your hands. Like it's one of the easier pieces of a piece to manipulate. So it's not that bad. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be an expert here. I'm a total amateur, but you know, I like it. It's fun. It's just little things I've learned by trial and error. Like shook my head there or something. I don't know. I think I was trying to stretch my neck because the GoPro's kind of heavy. <laughs> yeah, just smoothing her out. Making sure it's nice and big. Big vessel for coffee. And also, like, I wanted them to be big enough to fit, like, my hand in with a lot of space because I'm going to be sticking my hand in there to decorate it later. So, it all will shrink down way more than you expect. Yeah, I'm sh shaking my head again. Mm. Trimming, trimming, trimming. Let's jump a little further. Yeah. They sell other wooden implements that, you know, have curves on them rather than that sharp point so that you can get more of a nice taper on there. But I'm good. Like, I don't need it. I don't need it that much, I don't think. It'll be nice to have eventually. Picking up the last one. I managed to not squash it this time. And yeah, that's four out of four. Four little mugs. Slightly different shapes, slightly different heights, but I can make them a little bit more uniform in the next step. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the next step, they're dry now, or they're close to dry. Um, I've put it upside down so the open part is connected to the clay or the wheel base. I've got soft clay here, and it's clay that I saved from that little pocket on the inside of the wheel. Um, oh, and I was wearing closed toed. I mean, I was wearing open toed shoes because it was hot. So like, I'm gonna be censoring my toes here. But <laughs> you don't get to see free toes. But um, I'm now I'm trimming the bottom of the cup because when you slice it off it gets a little bit rough and uneven i just want to finish it off so it's not as flat yeah subscribers only for toes um i want to finish it off i want to increase the taper a little bit more um because the base like that edge is kind of thick and <laughs> i'm like looking at the curve that it makes i want it to be more exaggerated i like the I like that kind of traditional coffee cup shape. There's all these semi-dry trimmings that I can take. I can put those back into the reclaim bucket and those can get made into recycled clay. Or if they're soft, like sometimes they're still soft things. <laughs> Ghost censorship. Oh, there's gonna be a lot of that. Um <laughs> I, I don't know what to say, but <laughs> yeah, just making more of a nice curve. And I'm going to put a little foot on there, a little like rim or edge in there so that it makes like I like when there's a little divot at the bottom I'm I'm carving out the divot right now. And this is my favorite tool to trim with. It's like a stainless steel tool that um, cuts really easily, really sharply. This other one that I'm holding, it's like a $3 tool and it's aluminum. So it's not as sharp. It's a little softer, but it helps you get these nice gentle curves. And I'm kind of making the divot right now to figure out how wide I want the base to be and see how far off center the rest of the cup is. Like you can see there's a little more thickness forming around than, um, you know, it's not even on all sides, just at the base. The edge of the cup seems fine from what I can see, but I'm using this softer tool to shape and take off, flatten out that bottom part so I can see a little more effectively which sides are, you know, uneven. And then when I start it up again, I'm holding it really still. I'm holding the tool as steadily as I can with both hands 
and I'm just shaving down the sides so that it'll be, it'll even out more. Yeah. That little slice is bothering me. I think I'm going to make it shorter so I can, all right, I think I'm going to trim it shorter so I can like take out that little slice. Come on. Come on, Mori, you can do it. Come on. Yeah, come on. It's almost gone. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, please. But, yeah. Nice semi-dry clay. Going back to the sharper tool. This one likes, it's got a coating on it that likes to grab clay, especially when it dries and it's kind of annoying. But I'm uh, going back in with the sharper tool because um, sometimes the softer tool can, you know, get thrown out of whack a little bit by the movement of the wheel if it's going fast. The sharper tool cuts through more easily, so it's easier for me to center that divot in the in the butt bleh, in the base, and just cleaning out all the little schmutz in there, making a nice rounded edge on the base. Contemplating that little piece of clay, thinking about what I'm gonna have for dinner later, probably. I always could, okay, there we go. Nice, nice smooth edge. Nice consistent edge, more toes, more hidden toes. Yeah, there we go. I go to the studio after work or like I'll go when I just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll leave work a little early and then I'll have a call in the evening or something that I have to hop on, but I can just, you know, head back home before I need to do that. It all depends. I think that, you know, the wet throwing part of the process is probably the most labor intensive, just in terms of, you know, you have a lot of cleanup to do. There's a lot of different factors, like the kneading and the throwing and the, you know, keeping everything wet and getting it onto the boards. Like, you know, that's probably the longest part of the process. And then this is slightly easier because it's drier clay. You don't need to wash everything as thoroughly because of it. But it still takes a while just because, you know, as you saw in the first part, I didn't, tr I didn't make the shapes perfectly even. So trimming is where I really fine tune it. Yeah. And it's still semi-wet, so I can use a wet sponge to smooth out any little tracks or gouges from... The trimming tools. It still has a little bit of a striation in it, like a very, very tiny, subtle ridge because this is a coarser sponge. So I'm moving to this finishing sponge, which is super fine, and that makes it, uh, that makes all, almost all the little grains and ridges go away. It can't take care of all of them, but it helps. And then I'm probably gonna touch this and get a big thumbprint in it or something anyway, so. <laughs> It doesn't really matter that much because even, you know, even if you don't burnish it down as thir thoroughly as I'm doing here, um, you can still sand it. It's very sandable when it's first dried. It's even sandable after it's first baked, so it's fine. Yeah, smoothing out that edge. I was being such a perfectionist here. But, yeah, she looks pretty good. All right. <laughs> Apparently not. Doing one more pass. Wearing the gloves helps too because like you don't get as severe of a fingerprint. Oh, and I made this little, so these are mugs for Shinri and I took the little, like, uh, what is it? It's, it's in his stream overlay, there's almost like a Honko stamp. So I 3D printed it. I just took you know, the kanji and katakana for his name and made a little relief stamp of that. Oh yeah, the first one didn't turn out. The first one looked like dog ass. That's why I was filming this one. And it was, <laughs> the first one actually fell off. You can see it all dented up up there. But um, yeah, this one, the stamp took pretty well. It looked pretty nice. I'm all paranoid now. I'm like, oh, I gotta wash my hands. The biggest thing for me is like, <laughs> Thank you! Yeah, I like it. It's a little touch. It's just a little touch. But, 
Yeah, carefully picking her up. There might be some residue from those little loops. Oh, I really didn't want to show you the rest of that. But um, yeah, once it's trimmed, I had made these handles. These are pulled clay. So I pulled, I took clay that was fresh from the bag and dunked it in water. And while saturating it with a lot of water, you're able to pull it out like taffy and make it into this really long, narrow shape. They're kind of rough looking. They've been sitting for a couple days, but um, pulling the clay fr fresh from the bag helps in terms of strength because it's a continuous piece of clay. It hasn't gotten reformed from anything. It's fresh, like it doesn't have any air bubbles in it and it, it'll hold its shape well. It's still very elastic. So I've trimmed off a little bit of it to get it through the right length. And now I'm trying to figure out the position and overall shape. And you can kind of see the one to the left, like that's a fresh pulled piece. Um, I'm laying it down there so that it can just sit in that shape for a while and kind of get that shape memory. At least I think that's how it works. But yeah, they're not perfectly even, but you can just get it in, oh, flopped over. It's still wet. It's still kind of wet. And since it's kind of wet compared to this cup, I'm scoring a little rough patch of clay into it that takes off some of the dry surface on top, making sure it's still in the right position. I made it kind of off center. I'm going to die, but I guess the stamp is off center. I guess the handle is more centered. But yeah, scoring both the places where the handle will attach. There we go. Making sure there's just enough room and then scoring the handle as well because there's that funny little jar next to me that I'll be using in a second. And I told you earlier, slip is what happens when clay is super saturated with water to the point of being super liquid. So I'm using B-Mix clay. I've got B-Mix slip. I've got dirty hands too. Yuck. And then um, the slip is so wet, it helps act as like a paste. You use a decent amount of it on the rough patch and it starts to saturate it with water. It starts to make it wet and malleable. And then um, in a second, I'll be attaching the handle. I think I'm good. I'm good, right? Yeah, I used enough slip. Okay. Because pick up the cup, pick up the handle, and start to gently push it in. And this is part of why, like, I like to have a handle that's softer and more moisturized than uh, the cup I'm attaching it to, because you want the cup to be firm enough to still hold its shape. You don't want it to bow in when you're applying this pressure to it, but you want the handle to, you know, be malleable like this. I'm kind of pushing it and forming it onto the cup so that it'll stick more easily. And so this way everything keeps the proper shape. The slip that's gluing the two together will kind of act... It, I don't really know how it works, okay? But I, it, it acts as like a balancer between them. It kind of helps meld them because... Um, you know, it's transferring that moisture between them. It's not like one piece is drawing all the moisture out of the other. But yeah, I'm just trying to get a smooth transition from the handle to the cup. And it's really rough right now, but I can, you know, always smooth that out down the line. I just try to make the joins pretty even. It's kind of a funky curve, I think, because of the fisheye lens effect on the GoPro. But yeah, and I'm wetting the handle down because it's got some ridges in it that you can see. I want it to smooth out a little bit. I'm smoothing it with my fingers. And once it gets drier, I can carve it with a tool as well. One of the softer aluminum tools. They're so, I have like a million of them because they're so cheap. I only have five of them, but they're so cheap. And yeah, making sure it'll be a nice, smooth, comfortable handle to hold. I try to like always 
pick it up and make sure that it feels secure in my fingers. Well, I don't try to pick it up while it's still wet. That would just break it and I'd be sad. I've done that many times, but, uh, you know, make sure it's got enough room for your fingers so you're not like burning your hand on a hot cup. Then yeah, while I'm doing this, this is one of those aluminum tools. It's only like scraping the most excess off of it, trying to get everything out of that little loop with my pinky. But just clearing away the excess so that there won't be a big lump at the transition where the handle and the cup meet. Yeah, you can always scrub it down with your sponge. It's nice because um, the excess clay does kind of fill in any divots you make while you're doing this, so it's not like it's going to be a super rough, lumpy mess. It's still going to be rough and lumpy because I'm making it, but <laughs> they turned out pretty smooth in the end, I think. There's, there's a lot of sins that sanding and glazing will hide. Yeah, carving out that bit. This part's a little trickier. I end up going back a lot with the sponge and with slip if I really need it because that join, especially like it's such a small angle in there where the top of the handle joins that it's just like there's so much opportunity for things to get kind of rough and crumbly. But fortunately, it's always fixable. Even after, like, the only time you can't really fix a mistake on a piece is when it's been fully fired with the glaze on top. Because glaze is silica-based, usually. It's, you know, a mix of minerals that create almost a glass. That's why it's fired at such a high temperature. I think we fire at, like, 1400 degrees for the glaze, and that is enough to melt glass. So... It, um, it creates a glass coating, essentially, on the outside of your ceramic piece, and that's part of what helps it resist water and stay strong and sturdy. So yeah, making sure the handle is still pretty straight, just fixing up any more lumps and bumps while it's still somewhat wet. And while I do this, I'll like accidentally gouge it with my fingernails or I'll get a little bit of schmutz on it. You know, you can see there's still some ridges and things from it being thrown. Like, those show up a little more clearly once it's dry. But overall, it's starting to look like a mug. It's starting to look kind of nice. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Just, you get to see how much I fuss over stuff, though. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just putting these handles back over here. Those ones are still pretty wet. And I, uh, uh, mm, okay, there we go. Yeah, that one's more dry. So this one, you can kind of push the loop part down and just make sure you like the results. I like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's that. Um, oh. This is still before the mug gets baked, but, and the angle was weird on this, but you can see I'm applying this orange kind of paste. It's under glaze. So it's a type of clay slip that's mixed with a ton of pigment. And it doesn't, it's not a glaze because it doesn't have any hardening components in it. It's like putting a really, really, really liquidy uh, clay over the existing base clay, but under glazes will give you a really nice vibrant finish. And so they're great for when you want a vibrant color. Um, also, I just want to get back to my previous thought. Um, I was storing the mug upside down in that last one because uh, it helps with the gravity of the handle. Um, the top of the handle is heavier, so it wants to pull away when it's upright. So if you let it dry upside down, then gravity is helping it stay melded to the side. And yeah. The underglaze also helps because you're coating it in another layer of clay. It dries really quickly, um, but it still attaches, you know, it's it's moist and then it dries and it just creates another layer that's holding, you know, any additional pieces on, like the handle. I'm getting it in all the crannies and you can see I'm going kind of rough with it. It's, <laughs> I'm, I'm like just slopping it on. Because I want full coverage, and it takes several coats of underglaze to fully coat it. Um, they, 
it like, you know, I think that because of the thickness of the underglaze, it, you know, is somewhat rough and somewhat streaky, regardless of what brand you're using. I haven't tried any super expensive ones. This is a really affordable one, but like, you know, you have to go over it several times to make sure that the color will be fully opaque. And I'm painting it fully orange because even though I'm not trying to end up with an orange mug at the end, I'm going to cover it in black and use a stencil to make a design. I still want the coating to be uniform because when a glaze goes over, a glaze is a suspension of those pigments and minerals and silica in water. And it has a tendency, it's still somewhat fluid in the kiln at the end of the firing or like when it's being fired. So it'll do this thing called breaking over the, over significant edges. And so, um, you'll be able to see a little bit of the clay underneath through the glaze. There'll be like almost these clear edges on it, which I'm not explaining too well. You'll see it when it's all finished, but, um, I want it to be orange when it breaks over those edges. Cause I want it to have that consistency and I want it to be, it, it like gives it these kind of accents. It looks a little bit rustic or weathered. It, it's really cool, but yeah, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Glaze really helps smooth things out as well. Um, the underglaze, you know, it's going on. It kind of self levels a little bit when you put a new coat on. If you don't wait though, between coats, it'll start to like pull itself up. So it's just kind of a process. And it's nice that it's all a solid color because it doesn't really take a lot of brain effort on my part. I'm just trying not to make it too messy. Using a big fan brush because it gives nice coverage, but this fan brush has this annoying, it was like a dollar. So, you know, I'm probably just gonna clip off the metal edges, but like it has these little metal edges where the bristles meet the brush. And they like to scrape bits of it off. It's not a very good design. Oh well, though. It worked. It worked for my purposes. Underglaze is not really fun to get out of your brushes, so you don't really want to use precious, fancy brushes that cost a lot. I get the feeling like, you know, after a decent amount of use, I'll just have to throw this thing out. I don't think it, I don't think all the crud and like clay bits are gonna wash out of it easily. But yeah, starting on the next coat, going over any patches. Once it dries, you can see the patches better where it wasn't applied as consistently. So it's going good. Also, I like this little, it's, I think it's called a banding wheel. It's not it's not really a true banding wheel because in ceramics banding wheels are like these heavy duty like metal wheels with like measurement notches on them and they're really super efficient for trimming and things like that and decorating but um, I like this little lazy Susan it keeps me from having to handle the mug when it's still sticky or coated in wet underglaze so yep just getting those little pieces around the edge of the handle and wetting the brush a little bit. Oh, I wetted the brush a little bit just to see if I could smooth out a little bit of the underglaze. It's water-based, so you can clean it up with that. And um, I think what I can do at the end of this, that little bit on the inside rim, I can just go over that with a sponge a couple of times and it'll help take it away. But yeah, I'm underglazing a lot of stuff, so I think I was rushing a little bit. Mm-hmm. Let's see. I think you get the gist. Just going over every little patch to make sure none of the raw clay is showing through. Oh, okay. I skipped too far ahead. Ooh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. First time using VLC. First time using a computer. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So this stage, um, the green stuff is called wax resist 
and I'm using it on top of the orange to create a koi design. I made this koi stencil using a linocut kit. So it's a piece of linoleum actually that I carved the reverse of the koi out of. You can see it in my hand. And so I'm coating it with the wax resist. And the wax resist is a high temperature wax. Um, it repels water. So it repels water-based things like underglaze and glaze. And I'm just applying it on there, stamping it down. It ends up pretty thick, partly because when you carve linocut, it has to be kind of thick. And the wax resist also likes to spread out a little bit. But just getting a nice firm impression of it to make the coys from Shinri's stream overlay. And the ones on the stream overlay are kind of like weathered and rustic looking. They're supposed to be like an ink drawing. So I feel okay that they're a little bit blobby and funky, but yeah, you can see the ones that have dried versus the fresher ones. Um, so when, so the wax resist, when I dunk this into the glaze, I'm going to be dunking it into a black gloss glaze, but the wax resist will keep that glaze from adhering to the fish shaped areas. And so when it gets fired, the wax will eventually burn off and it'll leave just a clean, flat clay surface, but the black glaze will stay in all the other areas. So you'll end up with an orange impression of a fish. And I'm fortunate in that I carved this so that I can like, it, it was pretty easy to align the two coys to make that kind of circular feature like on the stream overlay, but it, uh, you know, in retrospect, I probably should have made a bigger stamp with both coys on it. And you can see here, I was having some trouble getting the full impression on there. So I'm just going in with a really, really thin brush and brushing on the underglaze and the areas that I can see didn't take. So I can make sure that it's going to be a more complete pattern. It didn't turn out perfectly on everything. Um, it didn't, you know, some of them are more fish shaped than others, but yeah, it was a fun experiment. It's my first time doing that. Oh, and also uh, the, oh yeah, the linen cut's starting to break down from me pushing it so hard because the clay is really dry at this point. It's, um, it's been baked. This clay has gone through the kiln. It's been bisked. So it's more like stone now than clay. All the, most of the water has gone out of it. So I'm just touching that up. And um, I want to decorate the insides of the cups with different glazes. So I've put blue painter's tape all over the insides so that they'll still stay clean. I'm going to dunk them in the black glaze first, and then I'm going to uh, pull the tape off, which hopefully won't leave any black residue. You can see a little bit around the edges, but for the most part, I was pretty successful. And so once the black glaze dunking is done, once I have the nice fish impressions on the outside and the uh, black glaze on the outside is all dry, I'll be able to decorate the insides with the scale pattern. God, it's starting to break apart so much. <laughs> I think I gouged too deep. The linocut stamp, you carve it with like these little hooked curved blades and these little tubular blades and I just, I hadn't done it in years. Linocut was something else I did in high school last. And so <laughs> it was, it's been a while. I used to love doing that though. But yeah, just touching it up. It's hard to do it on a curved surface, but unfortunately these aren't like super curved. Oh, what am I doing here? What are, what are we doing? Oh, <laughs> mending the stamp. <laughs> Trying anyway. It wasn't really good at adhering it, but meh. <laughs> going one last time the hardest thing i think was getting the wax resist the green stuff to be evenly coated onto this because it's kind of rough when you're carving into the linen cut it's hard to get it super consistent i you know i'm not the most patient person and i'm not the most precise person either but yeah, just stamping it in. 
Ichi, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome. I am decorating a mug, or at least I was when I first filmed this. <laughs> Welcome raiders. I'm Ghost Mori. Uh, I'm a humble ghost VTuber. Hello, Colt and stuff. Good to see you again. Yeah, you're watching the tail end of my decoration for some ceramic mugs. I went through the process of throwing them, forming them, like making the handles and everything. And now I'm stamping some koi fish designs on them. I'm even carving some of it out. I made these stamps that were koi fish shaped because I wanted to make these koi themed mugs for Joe Suiji Shinri's birthday. He's a Hollow Stars EN VTuber and he has these cool kois on his overlay. Aw, thank you so much! Yeah, right now I've got everything coated and thank you! Appreciate it! Yeah, I think they turn out pretty cool. So you can see here that wax resist is resisting the glaze, so now the koi shapes are standing out. It's nice and orange against the black, and the black glaze, it's already drying. It has a cool marbled effect that's not going to actually show up in the end product, but I'm making sure that it's not dripping too much. I'm making sure not too much excess is building up. I just dunked it in there with my hand. And I've got painter's tape on the inside of the cup so that I can decorate that later once it's fully dry. But I'm, you know, it's glaze is so prone to dripping. It really, really loves to make these lumps and bumps. And you can smooth it out before you put it in the oven. Oh, you used to do ceramics, E.T.? That's awesome. Yeah, that's part of why I wanted to do this again. I uh, loved doing ceramics in high school, but they didn't let me do power tools like this. <laughs> it was... <laughs> It's a lot more fun now as an adult with like pocket money to buy your own clay and materials. But yeah, I mix it up with a drill so it's nice and consistent and then I'm dunking it in there kind of slow, trying to get it over the rim but not too far because I don't want it to have a ton of excess glaze on the inside. And the inside is lined with painter's tape. Yeah, yeah, definitely try it again as an adult. Like I took just a one day class and it was awesome. That's started the addiction like a year ago. But yeah, I'm catching any drips from the glaze, setting these down on some paper just so they can dry. And once they're fully dried, I clean them up a little bit. <laughs> you can't be trusted with the power tools. <laughs> oh, you haven't been falling. Hi, McCoy. Nice. Oh, thanks for the follow. Awesome. No, thank you so much. Good to have you all here. <laughs> I think I think you can get around having to use power tools. I don't think you have to use them. I just like to use them. But um, this part... <laughs> You're going to just keep unfollowing and following forever, aren't you? You're going to get caught in a loop. Just, just follow when I'm not streaming. It'll be easier. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so you can't actually see what I'm doing here, but you can kind of see up in the top corner. Uh, let me Let me get my cursor. What I'm doing is I've got this stuff in the bottle. It's called Flux, and it's a type of glaze, silica-based glaze, that is super runny, and it induces other glazes to run. So, um, yeah, it's pre-recorded IRL arts and crafts. <laughs> Quality notification, thank you. Um, I did this all on a GoPro because I was like, the studio has really shitty Wi-Fi, and I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna try and battle with it to do a live thing and like struggle. But I'm making these little scale shapes because um, when I apply more glazes on and around these shapes, the flux glaze will make them runny, and it'll all meld together. Yeah, murder gloves. <laughs> I know these gloves go super high up my arm too. I've got long sleeves on but like the gloves would be useful for harvesting an organ or two or, or you know or just normal stuff normal stuff like ceramics normal normal non-crime things you know but yeah just uh i i'm in this segment i'm not sure how much you'll be able to see i'm experimenting with different shapes of and sizes of the little scales like, I'm also layering different glazes, which you'll see in a little bit. Some of the video gets corrupted towards the end, so that's going to be super janky. Like, <laughs> I I borrowed somebody else's GoPro because the first GoPro, like, just decided it hated me. But, um, yeah, making this little scalloped design, not super evenly. 
And I thought that the meltiness, yes, <laughs> skip around in the video, tell the story out of order, Pulp Fiction style. Yeah, we're going non-linear with this process. I'm Benjamin buttoning these mugs. We're going to start out with something that's close to being finished and then start again with a lump of clay. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the insides, uh, the painter's tape that I used in the beginning kept most of the black glaze off of the insides, but the glazes that I'm using on the insides are still pretty melty. They like to run more than the black glaze. So you might be able to see in the finished product, they actually draw some of that glaze down from the lip of the mug into the inside and make give it kind of this bleedy watercolor effect. It's kind of cool. Let me see. Oh, yeah, here. So I'm doing the flux and all of these are glazes that you have to layer multiple times too. I ended up doing... You know, I've got this little squeezy tube that's very helpful for this runny glaze, so I'm going to go over it again once it's dry. <laughs> you find another person with skeletal arms but flesh hands? Yeah, there are dozens of us. <laughs> you remembered? Oh, who did you remember? Yeah, I'm using these lighter orange glazes. These have kind of a watercolor effect. So this yellowy one I'm putting down as a base, just making little dabs of it, trying to get it somewhat thick. Um, trying to make sure that there's enough of it that it can run and create that watercolor effect that I'm going for. Uh, dab, dab, dab. Let me actually... I'm going to add browser. Let's make sure this isn't a mistake. Let's see. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, no. I hope you can't see that, but... Eh, bye, browser. Okay, I'm going to add window. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Ah! Firefox. Okay. So the technique I'm trying to do here with that is called the peacock technique. It creates, you know, so you're doing these little, I'm trying to scroll down in the thing. You're doing these little W's or these little arc scallop shapes and you put dots inside of them. Um, and the dots will bleed in like you can see that one in the center, the one in the center here, I really love. Um, you use the flux on the little lines. You use uh, more like, you can use any kind of glaze for the dots that you want to. Um, I used one that had more of a watercolor effect, but uh, you coat it with a secret third glaze. And that's probably gonna be where the video corrupts, but the glaze that I'm gonna put on top of all of this I have two of them. They're different colors. One is a more neutral sandy color and one is like kind of a coral orange. <laughs> Black Wolf from the... I just watched a clip from Wizards. I watched the one where the gnome guy, uh, uh, spoiler, like totally caps him. But <laughs> I was thinking about that. I was like, wow, that guy's got some great arms. Yeah, the Forbidden Glaze. There's, <laughs> there's these glazes that have kind of a translucent effect, but they have... Um, they are heat reactive and <laughs> I'll definitely watch Wizards. I love Ralph Bakshi. Yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, am I an honorary wizard because I've got the arms? Yeah, so once all these little glaze bits are done, I'll put that translucent glaze on top of it. It's like a color shifting one and it has glass crystals on the inside of it. So those glass crystals will, um, create darker effects and more like of that watercolory effect in there so yeah this is showing the second coat going on it's pretty sloppy i think if anything i think i was trying to do too many in a row i have like seven here and <laughs> that was kind of excessive um i mean i enjoyed experimenting with all of them but now that i know how to do it and like what i want i'd probably do just one or two so i can like focus you know, like, you know, really hard on just making everything more consistent. <laughs> Ichi pushed you down into the mud, stole your lunch money, and ran over your legs with a wheat thresher? That doesn't sound like them. You know, not a wheat thresher. I figured it'd be something sicker, like a Batmobile-type big, you know, fucking monster truck or something. <laughs> but, yeah. Doodling, doodling, doodling. And... 
finishing up the edges. I'm really glad I made these extra big because, you know, between all the baking and drying and things like that, my fingers were not starting to fit within the cup. Put that there. <laughs> Your Honda N NM401, yes, exactly. Okay, here comes the special glaze. So I've shaken it up. It looks like sludge. Oh, I've got my funny little mixer too. I love that thing. It just helps mix it up. And this glaze has particulates in it. It's those glass crystals I was talking about. So you want to like whip everything up so those are close to the surface. But I'm taking a nice big brush and I'm just slopping as much of this bad boy on as I possibly can. You want to make a thick, opaque coat. And you can see like the other glazes are put on so thickly that they're creating ridges underneath it. <laughs> it's This one is sandstone. Um, it's kind of a buff neutral color, and I thought it would be a nice kind of like cream neutral accent to the oranges. I, it was in, it's in a lot of the examples I showed you earlier in my browser. So, um, it's like, you know, I was thinking I would get similar results to that. I think it wasn't perfect. You know, I definitely want to try this again, but as it was, this is probably the easiest step, just slopping it all on, going turbo speed with my brush. Yeah, letting that dry, setting it off to dry. I did three of the sandstone and four of the like coral one because that was really fun. The coral one was a brand new glaze they made too. Like, I don't think there were any swatch photos of it online when I first started it, but yeah, it turned out really vibrant and nice. I actually want to try layering the two glazes eventually because I think they'd create a nice kind of in the middle you know, unique kind of orangey tone. I don't know. There's all sorts of, like, for some, I, I guess it makes sense that Facebook is where everybody posts it, but there are, like, these huge, robust Facebook groups of people who just play around with all different glazes and create wacky combinations and do, like, unboxing videos of their kilns where they're like, I just got the new batch out. Look at these glaze combos with me. And it's, like, a three-hour-long live, and I'm, like, trying desperately to scrub through it to get to the one <laughs> glaze combination I'm looking for. But yeah, that's like every niche hobby, isn't it? It's, you know, there's people who are super into it. And like, fortunately, ceramics, there's a lot of people who are super into like creating reference guides for everything they do. I mean, that's why I wanted this to do this technique in the first place, because I saw so many cool pictures of it online. So yeah, just scrubbing on all that glaze. I know. The only thing, though, I mean, I guess you'll run into it with any hobby company, but the makers of this, the people who, you know, have that big guide on the peacock glaze technique, they do a lot of different glaze techniques, and so many of them require, like, five or six glazes, which is, like, you know, this one, I think I spent a total of, like, $40 on glaze. It wasn't that bad, um, you know, making all these mugs, but it uses a lot of glaze. And when you're getting into like the six glaze territory, the ones they recommend are like 20 bucks each. I'm all, bro, I'm not spending $120 to make one mug. I'm buying a mug for that price. <laughs> this uses a lot of glaze because you want to get it on real thick. And I still don't think I got it on thick enough to really get the effect as vibrant, as pronounced as I wanted it to be. So, hmm, but oh well. Yeah. Oh yeah, the color's getting funky here. Is this where the video breaks down? It starts to go all vaporwave. <laughs> it will. Yeah, something went funky with it. Let's see. Let's skip forward a tiny bit. Sure, sure I'm putting all that glaze on. Oh yeah, here we go. The coral one. I love that little mixer. It's like the honeycomb honey server thing. I don't know. The only thing is, like, the little crystals get trapped in the little tines of it. It's kind of funky. But, yeah. In retrospect, I feel like I could have just poured glaze in here and sloshed it around, and maybe that would have had a better effect. It would have been, like, a really good thickness. Mm, it's either or. Yeah, the video was... I don't know what happened to the compression here. <laughs> it was like, well, I finally got it done, and then I ported the video to my computer, and it's like, it's corrupted, there's no way to fix it, and like, <laughs> put Subway Surfer on the screen. Yeah, I'm going to put, like, 
bejeweled or slime videos or like soap cutting in here. I'm just going to add that to my stream moving forward. Some kind of like multi picture in picture TikTok kind of format. Yeah. On the lid, you can see the little glass crystals really easily. They're almost like chocolate chips in an ice cream. <laughs> Your stream streams have a scary lack of delay when I watch them. I know sometimes I've got weird delay, sometimes I don't. I um, am in the habit of resetting my router religiously because I had to deal with like dog ass internet for the longest time. It just was bad, and then it turned out that my internet provider hadn't actually offered that tier of service, which was the lowest tier of service, for like three years. So I was just I don't know how I was getting internet in the first place. But they upgraded me to one, I have like 99 megabit or something. I've got like, I get like 600 download, which is pretty fucking decent, but it's for the same price I was paying earlier. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I was at the point where I was like attaching to my mobile hotspot just to be able to like send emails. It was bad, bad. I... <laughs> If I tried to have Netflix on and use my phone, I would have to switch to data. It was, like, bad. But, yeah, stream being able to watch videos in higher quality than, like, 240p was amazing. I, I was stuck in the dial-up era. <laughs> such is life. Such is being an adult. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> it just Your seven-year-old router just died when you tried to replace it. That's awful. At least mine, mine still worked. I mean, maybe it was working really well. It was about seven years old at the time too, but it's like, I, I do not know how I got internet off of that thing if internet was not technically being provided to me. <laughs> maybe I was just hooked up to a neighbor the entire time. <laughs> My building is so old and has so many tenants that I have hookups for like all three of the different major providers in my area. It's bizarre. Oh god, your router died when you tried to unplug it and plug it back in again. Yikes. <laughs> Forbidden Wi-Fi needles. <laughs> oh god. I... If I was without internet for a week, they'd get real sick of me at the library real soon. They'd be like, you can't stay here overnight. You can't come here at 1am when you can't sleep. There's gotta be a limit. Yeah. Just glazing, glazing, make sure those juicy little crystals are adhering to the top because this glaze is runny, so things will run down the sides when it's being baked, but uh, the crystals are also heavy, so like they're the most likely to pool at the bottom. You can't even really see, I'm sorry, but it's like you just want to make sure that everything distributes evenly. In the examples that I had... Uh, you like here i'll show it back up again let's just go like that it's like you know these guys these ones you can see these dark spots are where the crystals melted and so like on this one this is really dramatic yeah it uh you know it just has these really nice clusters of them they're evenly distributed they're not all at the bottom and that's what i was going for this one i think the crystals kind of melted down at the bottom but it still looks cool this is the same glaze I used for some of the dots. I'd like to try it with black glaze again soon. Yeah. These are so cool. Some of these are really interesting. I like when it's really runny. I like when it creates these kind of textures, these marbly stone textures. But yeah. Glazing, glazing, glazing. You always got to use more glaze. Honestly, I feel like the mantra is to just use as much glaze as possible. I'll watch people layering like 12 different glazes and it's like you good is that really necessary it's it's like it's it's just a mug it's not that deep but <laughs> for a year i thought i had really terrible internet but then it turns out i had a shitty wi-fi dongle plugged in that was worse than what my computer had inside of it okay i have the opposite my motherboard has the worst wi-fi dongle in existence and it wasn't an issue when i was first setting up my pc because like i i use ethernet my place is so small my router is only three feet from my computer it's fine but like <laughs> yeah internet dongles give me the same feeling as being told to download more ram exactly it's like it, it's it, we're in the year 2020 x it shouldn't be this way but like i have one of those funky little antenna guys it was like ten dollars and my wi-fi connection instantly jumped up 
to like almost the same rate as my ethernet, which is very nice. I enjoy that. So I had to have Wi-Fi so I can use VTube Studio. Otherwise I would just be plugged in all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Your Wi-Fi card had screw on antenna. <laughs> I think mine came with it as an option. Oh, okay. We're done. So that was the end of it, but you can see here the finished mugs. These, so the glaze baked down and that flux glaze went ahead and, you know, made these little arcs. It's not as defined as I wanted. It turns more translucent on the sandstone ones and it's whiter on the coral ones. I think the glaze name is Amaryllis, but you can see it's all shiny. It's nice and smooth on the inside. The little black specks are where the crystals were, so there really weren't that many that showed through in the end. And there's that black kind of bleeding on the edge where the opaque glaze went. Yeah. <laughs> Ride a bike, IRL streams, let's go. Yeah, power your computer that way. Power the generator for your streaming backpack. Yeah, the glaze is bleeding in there. Um, and what was I going to say? But it created that cool water color effect I was going for. I think you can tell too. This one, I ended up doing like three coats of the orange dots. I think this bottom one, it was only like random levels of it. I think it was more uneven. And this one, the glaze is actually so thick. Or well, oh, it was layered over the lighter yellowy orange glaze. So like the orange isn't really showing through at all through the coral, but you can also see, I think, on this one at the bottom, you know, those edges where the orange is showing through, that's why I coated the whole thing. It uh, just makes makes it so that when the glaze breaks over the edge, you still have a consistent coating. And there's the koi. They're all unique. They're all very special and unique because of how they were stamped on. Yeah. It's... It's just the raw clay bottom. It's like matte and sand. It feels like sandpaper, but because it's been fired twice, there's no more water left in the structure. So it's not going to be able to absorb any liquid. You can go ahead and wash these as you'd normally want to. Yeah, that's the shiny boy. That's the finished cup. It ended up being kind of cool, but I've already got ideas on the next thing I want to do. Yeah. And we're just looping over, I think. <laughs> They're safe to drink from. Um, so glaze manufacturers will mark on the bottle, like, you know, is this food safe? The uh, two designations are food safe, which is safe to drink from, or like store food in if it's a big bowl or whatever. And then dinnerware safe, which is like for plates if you're safe to use a fork and knife on it. So these ones are food safe, which means, you know, as long as you don't scratch them and pull up little particles, they're totally safe to drink things from. Most glazes you don't want to use strong acids on, like if you're going to pour straight up vinegar into a bowl. But, um, you know, like food safe ones, yeah, it's, if you left a whole lemon in here, it might, it might start to degrade the color, but it probably wouldn't make it unsafe for human consumption. It's just, yeah, average strength coffee will not damage these. But yeah, dinner, this is not dinnerware safe, so don't, you don't want to like gouge it out with like a really sharp spoon. I don't know what people do, but <laughs> yeah, it's pretty maximum strength coffee, just unadulterated coffee. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> espresso mixed with nitrous. It's one of those cold brews that comes in a can with the skull on it. <laughs> in that case, you wouldn't be using a mug, would you? At least I hope not. <laughs> a string of three words that reminds you Steve Omato exists. God. <laughs> yeah. Mm, there's my mugs. And I gave these away to friends and things like that. <laughs> you have to deal with the consequences now. I'm not sorry. <laughs> but there we are. Fancy little koi mug for watching your favorite streamer. And 
that's it. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. That was kind of a short one, but I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned way too much trying to wrangle the GoPro and all the different things involved. Like, I'd love to do a proper hand cam someday. I still want to like build a Gundam or some kind of Plamo kit on stream. That'd be really fun. I'm looking into options and I think people had some cool camera suggestions last time. But um, yeah, no, appreciate it. Like this was a fun project. I learned a lot as I've already said. And I'm gonna send you all on a raid to see Lost Lidu because she's playing some awesome stuff right now. Let's see. And yeah, I'm glad everybody could make it. Thank you so much again. I will see you next time.